So I'm talking about interventions for uh, to, to um, increase housing uh, for the poor. So the aim is to situate this emergence of public-private partnerships, if you want, in social housing historically. So looking at the, the changing nature of public-private interactions across time as promoted by um, the, the World Bank. And uh, the focus here on the World Bank, I think, is, uh, is uh, legitimate, given that the World Bank is such an important actor uh, in development uh, in general and has also uh, played an important role in shaping uh, the discourse around uh, housing. So I see the World Bank very much as an agenda setter, uh, both in terms of advocacy but also in terms of policies in practice through its own uh, programs in development broadly uh, and in housing in particular. And I think that it's quite interesting to look at uh, shifts in World Bank advocacy and policies for us to identify the mutations, if you want, in what I see in essence to be a neoliberal agenda as promoted by the bank in, the, in general, again, in development, but also uh, in housing. And so the focus that I then uh, have on the World Bank, I think, and social housing or housing for the poor allows us to tease out what I call the kind of core principles of neoliberal provisioning of housing which include uh, user charges, which include individual or collective provisioning, which include the promotion of private agents, whatever they are, and I take the point of this very kind of um, uh, heterogeneous set of private agents involved. And also the focus on the World Bank allows us to see how this particular set of core principles, if you want, that characterize in my view neoliberal provisioning, have themselves been transformed over time as they come to accommodate an increased uh, uh, preoccupation with finance. Uh, so uh, the, the focus on the World Bank in the context of housing allows us then to look at how we've seen this mutation of a neoliberal agenda that was incipient in the 1970s in the way the World Bank was promoting uh, particular shelter interventions, how that mutates to then increasingly reflect a focus on finance and how that then comes to embrace, if you want, most recently in the last 10 years, um, an interest equally in public-private partnerships as another form of public-private interactions that had been ongoing since the, the, the World Bank had been taken a stance. Now, in a way, uh, this all stands, if you want, in contrast to a much more traditional focus in development discourse prior to uh, these developments on public finance for social housing, which kind of ties into the issues we're saying. So in essence, the presentation is about uh, teasing out core elements of what we can, what I call neoliberal and financialized <coughs> systems of uh, housing provisioning, which then raise a whole set of questions, tying nicely again to the conclusions of Darshina, which is about who is involved, what are they doing, uh, how are they doing it and what kind of, uh, to what effect, what kind of uh, outcomes do we see. So the way I want to proceed is first I want to give a brief historical overview of the World Bank in, in the World Bank's involvement in housing and shelter uh, and that then leads into looking at public-private partnerships as a concrete manifestation of want a neoliberal agenda in social housing today, and then reflect on the four elements of what I see as this neoliberal financialized system as promoted by um, the World Bank. So first, very briefly, if we want to um, look at the trajectory of the World Bank's involvement in housing policy, then we see that the World Bank uh, made an entry into housing and urban, uh, uh, urban development was called shelter at the time in the early 1970s. This was under the leadership of uh, the then World Bank President McNamara, who was seeking to reorient uh, the, the, the kind of the focus of the bank away, not just, away from just focus mainly on infrastructure, etc. So he wanted to address what was called basic needs, including shelter. But what we see as the bank enters this particular uh, field of interventions, um, it's kind of conflicted in being both bank and, have, and hence uh, having to kind of uh, operate according to a set of principles and then now taking on what was perceived to be a much more welfareist type agenda. And in a way to square that contradiction from the start as the bank enters, for instance, shelter 
uh, interventions is that disbursing loans for uh, housing programs, it does so very explicitly with a focus on uh, markets and with a commitment to private house building. So as the bank enters the field in the 1970s, it does so explicitly with a focus on markets and with an explicit commitment to <coughs> private house building to displace what was the tradition at the time of um, a commitment to um, public uh, house building programs. So what we see is that the World Bank's uh, shelter portfolio in the 1970s, reflecting this focus on markets and the private, is entirely dominated by, by what are called sites and services and slum operating uh, programs. Uh, so sites and services, the government provides a piece of land on which then individuals construct their own uh, house, where slum upgrading involves just incremental changes to uh, slum areas, and that can then include the provision of land tenure, if issues around land can be resolved. It also includes the upgrading of infrastructure, like water, sanitation, sewerage, etc. Now, the essential features of those programs, these sites and services and slum upgrading programs for which the bank was extending loans, was that they promoted private over collective provisioning, that they promoted home ownership or ownership of your, of your shelter unit over any other form of tenure, and that we saw a very strong reliance on the state to support private provisioning. The first such housing loan was dispersed uh, to Senegal in 1972 for a large site and service um, program across two cities. Now, the aim of the programs is clearly to provide public assistance through bank funding, so the bank would disperse these loans through a particular government, and these governments are then to provide public assistance for <coughs> private housing provision, where this private housing investment was understood often to take place through what's called the dweller self-help efforts. But so we see a very strong kind of uh, impetus from the bank to, pro to, to seek these governments that it is lending to to provide public assistance for private provisioning. So from the from the moment that the bank starts lending, the World Bank starts lending in this area, we see that the interventions strongly steer away from any lending for public uh, housing construction. This becomes actually a conditionality. So it will enshrine in its contracts with its borrowing governments that these governments should no longer. Uh, use uh, fiscal resources for public housing construction, it should use the resources uh, that it wants to mobilize for housing in support <coughs> of private house building. So that, that becomes part and parcel of the conditionalities uh, of the loans when it is when the bank is dispersing uh, loans to countries for sites and services. So the interventions then become guided by three operational principles. One, to provide what is called low-cost affordable housing uh, for low-income families. The second, we have the operational principle of the cost recovery from the beneficiaries through what are user charges, which here now are paid, of course, in installments over a number of years. And the aim is to eliminate any form of public subsidy going towards housing provisioning. And a third principle was also that these projects should be replicable, where the idea is that once you have cost recovery, this would demonstrate allegedly profitability to the private sector, and the private sector would move down market in its provision uh, of housing equally for low-income families. So these were the ideas that were governing. So one, the houses needed to be low cost and hence affordable. The cost had to be recovered. And through the recovery of these costs, the idea was that you would actually demonstrate to the private sector that these markets of providing houses for low-income ha households are profitable. At the same time, we see uh, where more traditionally um, standards in housing were determined professionally by the, the professional bodies determining standards. We now have budgetary limits that start governing the standards uh, in, in housing. So if you want, we see the emergence of core features of what I call an incipient neoliberal form of social policy, where we move from publicly funded provision outside of the logic of community provision to individual provision that is now determined by the capacity of to pay through use of charges in the case of housing that happens then in installments. 
And what we see, and we see this uh, <coughs> as far as the World Bank is concerned, it is almost as if housing as a sector is spearheading a whole wave of broader social policy reform that will become increasingly prevalent from the 1980s onwards. In OECD countries, we see equally that housing was a frontier sector in which welfare reform was uh, initially uh, pioneered. Um, during the 1980s, so that was the 1970s, the way the bank entered the sector with this particular emphasis on the private and the conditions of when it was dispersing money for these uh, governments no longer to mobilize public finance for public uh, housing. During the 1980s, what we see is a, a further development in World Bank programs for housing is that we see a very strong radical shift towards housing finance. So from the 1980s onwards, most of the World Bank programs for that it will uh, disburse for housing, most of its loans, are going to be specifically uh, for housing finance uh, programs. So we see that physical interventions, uh, such as science and services programs or slum upgrading programs, become much less important in the World Bank housing or shelter portfolio. So we see much less of an emphasis on the built environment in its own um, housing portfolio. Uh, in the minds of the bank, it was access to finance, so they have now identified a constraint on the demand side that's holding back adequate access to shelter. So the argument is it's, uh, there is this constraint on the demand side, it's because people don't have access to finance that actually we don't see massive increases in, in shelter um, and uh, there is no, for in their proposition, there were no real constraints on the supply side. Uh, so the idea is that once um, the housing finance is available, affordable low-income housing will be provided by the private <coughs> sector. Yeah, so we have this twofold aim. We have one, to replace public with private sector financing uh, of, for low-income housing, and at the same time to encourage the private provisioning uh, of housing. So we're replacing public with private sector finance for low-income housing by incorporating local market-based financial institutions in the provision of housing finance and by discouraging the use of direct credit towards the housing sector. Now the result is that we see this very rapid expansion of World Bank lending for housing uh, finance and that combines with the dismantling of housing banks and public housing agencies in developing countries. Now the shift towards housing finance, so the shift away from the emphasis on the physical, on the built environment, towards housing finance was itself accompanied by uh, a reform of the subsidy regime away from, as people now are allegedly going to have increased access to housing finance, there was the subsidy regime was transformed away from interest rate subsidies on this uh, credit for your house towards one of capital grant transfers. Yeah, so this was a demand side, if you want, voucher style intervention where um, a capital grant is given to borrowers which is used as a subsidy, as collateral for their access to loans. Yeah, and this was a scheme that was originally developed in Chile uh, where it's been used as a strong um, demonstration uh, example and then it gets exported to South Africa, etc. It's a form of conditional cash transfer. So rather than having subsidies on the interest rates, on the loans that people have to take uh, to increase their access to housing, we now have an attempt to roll out this what's a capital grant transfer scheme where people are given a lump sum rather than a subsidy on an interest rate. And this, this lump sum is supposed to act as collateral or as your deposit in your access to a, a loan. So the idea again is that upfront housing subsidies are targeted at the poor to enable their access to housing finance and this is to combine with private sector providers delivering houses through the market. So again, in counterpoint to the old model of supplying mass-produced units to a certain standard which are allocated administratively, uh, i.e. not on the basis of the market. So we're moving from the, as a model if you want, as a paradigm, we're moving from the financing of public social housing builders to subsidized consumption of market-produced houses. So the houses are to be delivered competitively in this kind of uh, model through the market. They are to be delivered competitively through the market by private agents, and they are to be bought by households 
on the basis of their access to housing finance, which is now promoted through this cash transfer, through this capital grant uh, subsidy. So this, and um, Tarshini already uh, elaborately talks, talked about this, this of course uh, then implies a, an, an entire redefining of the role of the state uh, in the sector. So the state is now to create regulatory environment and build institutional capacity for the private sector. It's not to be directly involved in any form of housing provision. The state is an enabler, it's a manager of the sector as a whole, it should develop property rights, it should develop mortgage finance, it should rationalize subsidies. We saw this very nicely in the UN Habitat document, which has actually uh, uh, um, promoted very similar type of paradigm as, as the World Bank. There's been very strong convergence between the World Bank and human habitat in terms of how they understand kind of global policy with regards to housing, um, etc. Now, what we see for those that are familiar with a little bit of World Bank kind of scholarship, the World Bank during the 1980s was promoting all these things, and then the, as the <coughs> results of that were not so positive as it had anticipated, during the late 1990s we see this uh, shift towards a post-Washington consensus where the, uh, the emphasis is now on oh, the market is not so perfect, there is a whole set of imperfections, we need the state to intervene when there are these market imperfections, etc. So we move from this perfect market paradigm to this imperfect market paradigm and Joe Stiglitz is very famously attached to this post-Washington consensus. Now what we see also in housing is we see similarly. Now of course this paradigm that they were promoting was not at all producing the results that they were wishing. Mainly middle class uh, customers were the beneficiaries and also in terms of the bank's own portfolio, mainly middle income countries were the beneficiaries of their loans. So they had to kind of refocus a little bit their agenda and in the context of post-Washington consensus kind of posturing, we see two distinct features also in the housing agenda. Poverty is brought back onto the agenda and is now combined with participatory efforts. So now there's a kind of this big emphasis on participation. However, across these new kind of uh, proclamations, we, the strong emphasis on finance remains central. So we see that finance as one core element, tenure and participation become the core uh, constituent elements of this renewed poverty mission, if you want, in shelter provisions. So the imperative is to integrate poor people that had been previously marginalized during this rise of housing finance and shelter policy, but to integrate them into finance-led provisioning through all these financial inclusion type schemes, rather than to rethink the finance-led paradigm. So it's not about rethinking housing finance as the way to increase shelter access, it's about including the poor through various form of financial <coughs> uh, initiatives into this. And that brings me then to, if you want, the World Bank agenda today, how do we then kind of uh, situate the rise of public-private partnerships formally, because in a way everything I have been talking about is about public-private interactions mm -hmm. under different forms, both through finance, in, the, in, in, in uh, construction, etc. But what we see in the World Bank's agenda, at least in terms of how this advocate of global policy and, and uh, this, this, this burst of loans to governments has been shifting its own agenda is that we see in the last 10 years in World Bank shelter practices, when you look at the, low, the way I have come up with these kind of uh, propositions is because I looked at how the World Bank's housing uh, portfolio has changed over the years. I looked at the specifics of all the loans they've been disbursing. And we see in World Bank Shelter Practices in the last 10 years, we see a, con a consolidation of the promotion, promotion of housing finance, including for the poor, and that has been not affected whatsoever by the global financial crisis. Yeah, so housing finance for the poor, which was the root of yeah, the whole implosion that we saw with the global financial crisis, is very much what the World Bank is about when it comes to housing. And we see a continued core role of the private sector for the provision of housing. But we see a modification of how private sector-led provision is promoted, where now we see more attention for these public-private partnerships, which are aiming to uh, kind of act, assist in large-scale up, uh, large upscaling programs, complementing the previously celebrated more incremental self-help approaches. So the World Bank 
has come to realize that despite sometimes far-reaching reforms of land and housing markets and despite the expansion of mortgage markets in many developing countries, we haven't seen the significant dent, as they want to see it, in housing deficits. And in that context, they are seeking to broaden their model in terms of the supply side. And that now is away from just the more incremental self-help approaches to incorporate large-scale uh, 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 programs through what are then public-private uh, partnerships. So public-private partnerships have started to play in the World Bank programs, uh, if you want, a critical role in delivering affordable housing uh, in various uh, developing countries. So if you look at the World Bank's housing portfolio in the last um, six to seven years, you see an increased prevalence of lending for public-private partnership, particularly in Latin America uh, for uh, housing. And in a way, so this is part and parcel, so it's a way to overcome deficiencies or contradictions in its own uh, agenda as it had been promoting it. At the same time, it slots more generally in a, a revival of, or, uh, uh, of public private partnership promotion that we have seen very strongly. It's all equally in housing addressing failures of previous privatization efforts, whether it's of finance or of construction, because they are not delivering uh, the goods. And um, so we have a global revival. We have issues to do with housing itself. We have the role that the World Bank plays as, a, as an international financial institution. And we have also within, if you want, within finance, we have the development of uh, global institutional investors seeking uh, particular types of instruments that provide them with uh, stable yields. And public-private partnerships in different forms of infrastructure, including housing, have been promoted in the in financial investment community as offering this kind of uh, yields, as offering that kind of stable instrument that has inflation protected yields that are in excess of uh, quite a bit of other stable instruments, government type of securities, especially in the wake of uh, quantitative easing. So there is this idea that funds from in global institutional investors, let's say pension funds, insurance funds, should be mobilized to address different infrastructure deficit gaps, as they are called, including the housing gap. So there is this idea that we're going to connect these long-term resources that are held by pension funds, insurance funds, hedge funds, etc., with the need for these massive investments in uh, developing countries. And you see that, for instance, private consultancy firms like McKinsey come up with very specific advice to capture this trend. And they have written, for instance, in 2014, a document that's called a blueprint for addressing the global affordable housing challenge where they, cap where they reflect on these new trends for the scope for large scale industrial approaches to housing offering these opportunities for private institutional investors to participate in these public private partnership arrangements. And these advocacy efforts themselves then include calls for, for instance, the despecification of building requirements where they call for reducing ceiling heights, for using less expensive electrical or plumbing fixtures, etc., etc. So we see um, this particular trend of trying to mobilize particular sources of funds to address this housing deficit itself then translating in guidance around standards that, um, of how uh, shelters or provisions should proceed. So we see, if you want, core elements of neoliberal financialized uh, system of housing provision coming to manifest itself. Previously, we had housing finance being combined with incremental self-built housing practices. Today, we have the combination of housing finance with large-scale formal uh, public-private uh, partnerships. Uh, but so we see, if you want, the public-private interaction element of housing as promoted by the World Bank changing in nature, but continuously being promoted. So there is no, at no point, of course, a return to uh, uh, a kind of rearticulated role of the state. So at its core, despite its various mutations over the years, we see since the 1980s a set of elements governing um, housing <coughs> approaches as promoted by the bank. On the one hand, they, it will always include an element of housing finance, including microfinance. So we have these attempts of micro-housing finance for those that are too poor to uh, borrow. 
Then secondly, we have the idea of multiple providers, so the idea of choice, the idea of competition, uh, multiple providers on the supply side, which now recently has to come to encompass public-private partnership arrangements because there's increased dissatisfaction with the incremental approaches as they were previously promoted. And this is combined with market approach where we have an intervention on the demand side through finance, the celebration of choice and competition and private provision on the supply side, of course, has to have a safety net. And here is our cash transfer. That's the safety net to, to um, accommodate the, if you want, the, the, the worst outcomes from uh, housing finance and, and competition and choice. So of course, that then raises a whole set of issues, as I conclude, um, in terms of how do we, what, how do we understand there is all the unpacking to be done around what is private, what is public, how do they interact, how, to have, how, how does this global kind of, uh, if you want, policy advocacy translate very specifically in very specific context, and that then raises issues around what are implications for access, what are implications for equity, quality, uh, what's the nature of the different agents involved, and in a way it's all about opening the black box between the conceptualization of a particular intervention at, say, the level of such a global institution as the World Bank, how, what, how does that then become implemented in practice, who are the actors involved, what's the terms of their involvement, etc., and what are then the particular outcomes that we observe in terms of access, the quality of the shelter, the cost at which it is available, etc. So it's about kind of unpacking the way in which this global policy becomes implemented, who is involved and to what effect. So who, what, how. 